Hello, beloved. Welcome back to FTM TV, to Walking Through the Word, where we walk verse by verse through the Word of God. Oh, so beautiful to see all my lovely friends here. I've been packing and unpacking as I have a new home. The Lord is so good. He's enlarged me. Amen. For the kingdom of God so that Jesus can be glorified. Today, the Lord has given me a message in Matthew chapter 25 as we continue in our chapter by chapter study of the word of God that will really bless you with full of revelation depicting exactly where we are in time and the things Jesus spoke to me face to face while I was in his presence in heaven. There's so many revelations and truths revealed in this chapter and I can't wait to dig into the word of God where there's a lot of gold for you when we come back. Well, welcome back to Walking Through the Word. I'm your host, Janine Fox, and today we are starting a new chapter of Matthew chapter 25. For those who may not be familiar with this chapter, it is the parable of the ten virgins. Very familiar verse and very relevant of where we are today in 2024. And so let's open up in a word of prayer. Father God, I want to thank you for my sisters and brothers today. I want to thank you for your love for us. I want to thank you for all those that you drew to this channel today because you're going to speak divine revelations, divine truths that will transform their life, that will catapult them to the next level, and that will prepare them for your soon coming appearance in Jesus' name. I ask, Holy Spirit, that your our hearts would stir with your word, our hearts would be quickened with your words, and as I speak today, they would not hear the words of Janine. They would hear the words of the Holy Spirit speaking directly to them. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, praise the Lord. God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. Let us dig into Matthew chapter 25. Now, at my age, you need your glasses. <laughs> Starting in verse 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins which took their lamps, went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps, but took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom come, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest it be not enough for you and for us. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourself. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterwards came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for you know not the day nor the hour when the Son of Man comes. Oh, this chapter is so relevant for today. You know, we are in the end times. We are seeing wars and rumors of wars. We are seeing pestilence in diverse places, volcanic eruptions, comets coming out of space. We are seeing tremendous earthquakes and floods and tsunamis. We are seeing men's hearts failing for fear, looking at these things that are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven are being shaken in this hour. And how many of you know, if you think it's bad now, it's going to get worse. This is depicting that we are now in the end times. We are racing toward the tribulation period any day, any moment. And so therefore, we have an alert that we need to watch. Now here in the parable of the 10 virgins, we have 10 virgins. That, that means they're all Christians. They all love God because they said, Lord, 
You have to normally be born again Christian or someone who really, really has a close relationship with Jesus to call him Lord or in the spirit in some way. Therefore, these are born again Christians. They are spirit filled Christians, most of them. And they are Christians who really had a serious walk or encounter with Christ because they said, Lord, okay, you are our Lord. Or at least they think they were. Five of them were wise because they took extra oil. The oil is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. And if we go back to the mention of oil in the Old Testament, we see it mentioned first in the book of Exodus, where the Lord tells the priests that they are to light the lamps, the lampstand, the golden lampstand in the tabernacle, in the holy place. There was an outer court, there was an inner court, which is the holy place. There was an inner inner place which was the most of holy and in the holy place was a lampstand with pure gold and the priest was to light that fill that with oil three times a day it was supposed to be filled with oil and the lamps were not supposed to go out now the thing about oil which is very significant is is that oil in those lamps in the past that would illuminate the holy place that oil not only would not burn if the wick was dirty. Number two, the oil would not burn if the oil was dirty. And number three, the lamps would not illuminate. They would not burn if they were not filled with oil. This is a good type and symbol of today as we, hallelujah, being God's lamps, okay? We know Jesus is the light of the world, but we are the, we are a lamp. We are a light that shines in darkness. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit when the person of the Holy Spirit comes in our life is a type and shadow of its in filling is oil that's being filled with the Holy Spirit. Ephesians says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. He's saying, be filled over and over and over again. So to light the lamp in the holy place, that the lamp would always be illuminated, it needed to have a continual resurgence of oil. Three times a day, they needed to be lit and the oil needed to flow to light the lamps. And today we need to have clean oil. We need to have our be full of the Holy Spirit, meaning not just commune with the Holy Spirit once, but commune with him on a regular basis. Because how many of you know in today's world, especially if you're in full-time ministry, that our wicks burn out. We get tired. We get down. We get exhausted. We overwork. And we have to continually stay in a relationship with the Holy Spirit and ask for his presence to fill us. How does that happen? And like Mary, as we sit at his feet, as we read his holy word, we're filled. His word is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. And his word, amen, is living. Amen. The Bible says that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God through the word of God as we eat it and digest it is nourishment. And of course, as we commune with the Holy Spirit in his presence. Oh, hallelujah. He's the oil and he fills us. Now, Jesus was the perfect example that he regularly filled his lamp with oil, even though he was the son of God, even though he was God in the flesh, he also operated as a man. And I love that the Bible depicts him as a man in many verses. When we see that through his ministry, his great ministry, he needed himself to be refilled. He would go up to the mountain. He'd come back down to the mountain. And when would he go? In the midnight hours. He would go from two to six in the morning. Those are the hours of visitation. Those are the hours when everyone is asleep. <laughs> For most people. And he would go away from his house because he did have a house. And he'd go all the way up to the mountain and spend time with the father because he recognized that he had no virtue, no dunamis power, no infilling unless he was filled himself. You cannot give away what you don't have. And that is why he was full of the Holy Spirit, because he spent time with Abba, Father, communing, getting that blueprint, speaking to him, amen, letting the atmosphere of heaven fill him every day as he spoke to the Father, and then he come down from the mountain. And some of the greatest miracles in the Bible are written after he came down from the mountain. Hallelujah. And that's the same with us, beloved. We need to be filled with oil. So the five that were foolish, they were not filled with oil when the master came. In verse 8, something very interesting that changes the story a little bit. It said, the foolish said unto the wise, give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. Which meant they had oil from the beginning. Oh, what a danger, beloved, especially when we're in ministries that we minister to others. That sometimes in our love and zeal for God and our commitment to him, we run out of oil and try to run off the flesh. And there's no oil there. 
<laughs> it's just dirty oil and then we are no longer a light and we, we we move into the flesh and we get out of the spirit and we start acting you know in all kind of ways that we've been redeemed from because we are not getting our source from the empowerment of the person of the holy spirit and his divine nature is no longer being able to be it, it fueled through our lives now this happens to all of us so at one point those five virgins who love god they still called him lord they were busy and they didn't think they needed to get extra oil and the question is why it's because they borrowed oil they said would you give us of your oil for our lamps are going out these believers were used to borrowing someone else's oil and today i want to ask you are you living on borrowed oil and do you borrow oil from others oh this is something interesting is it possible to borrow oil from others yes you know the fivefold ministry your pastor your apostle the prophet the teacher the the evangelists all of these five offices they are meant to empower the body of Christ so that we do the work of the ministry and they give us oil when they when your pastor gives his sermon he's given us oil the Bible tells us that we should go to church we should not neglect the assembling of ourselves why because in his presence in the assembly of the congregation there is oil amen the presence of the Lord comes the angels are there when two or more gather together, there's a greater anointing. There's a corporate anointing. The oil is coming and filling us. Yes, we're getting oil from those sources. We're getting oil when we hear CDs and television programs of the word of God. We're getting oil when we worship God and when we listen to anointed Christian music. Hallelujah. We're getting oil. It, it's being borrowed to us because it's not our oil. It's coming from someone else. Oh, are you catching that? But the emphasis here is that we should not live on borrowed oil from what we get from others, but the main source of our oil should be fueled from our own personal walk with the Holy Spirit. And the danger here is that these Christians were going around doing a lot of duties, listening to a lot of programs, but they were not cultivating, regularly cultivating their walk with the Holy Spirit and with Jesus, with the Father. They were not having the regular devotion time and they were not sitting on long enough in his presence that the dry tree could be oiled and that their cup would run over as in Psalm 23. God desires that our cup would run over. Oh, what did he say? He said when we, he'll place us at a table in the presence of our enemies, that's the world today, and he will anoint our head with oil and our cup will run over as we're sitting at the table of the Lord. And that's a, that's a place with you and Jesus, the table of the Lord. But I want to encourage you, beloved, not be like the five virgins. What happens is that when we're negligent and we're living on bar oral, we don't have enough. Now, the bridegroom came, they heard the shofar, they heard the trumpet, and the virgins who were ready had extra pockets of oil in their belt. And that's what they did in Israel. They were extra pockets in their belt. And the ones who were not ready, they were getting it from YouTube, from TikTok. <laughs> and they have a chance to get on social media to get more oil and they didn't have enough in themselves to make the journey. Well, why was it important for them to have full oil? because they needed oil to make it through the night. Now I want to talk about a visitation that I had many years ago that's changed my life forever. I'll never forget it. But you need oil in the rapture. You need uh, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Many years ago when I was at the Brownsville Revival, so many were born again by the Spirit, hundreds of thousands of people. I was visiting from Europe and I had an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, a depicted rapture, what the rapture would be like during the night. I was full of the Holy Ghost as they were praying with me. And about one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning, the lights went out at church. I was so full of the Holy Spirit, my friends had to drag me in the van. We went to Pensacola Beach where we were staying at a condominium. And I was so drunk, I had an open vision that I was in a church. I couldn't tell if I went to sleep. I didn't go to sleep. I just went right into an open vision that I was in a church. I was preaching and I said open your Bibles to and when I was telling the congregation open their Bibles I heard the trumpet sound and immediately I started shaking like a rocket like this my body became like a rocket and the anointing of the Holy Spirit the oil in me the presence of God in me the dunamis power in me the amount of the Holy Spirit in me was beginning to mean we're getting to shake up shake up just like a rocket and be activated for takeoff Immediately the room disappeared and went totally black and within seconds I found myself flying through the air in a whirlwind just like Elijah was 
a very large cloud rolling all over me, shooting lightning and fire and all different beautiful colors of the spectrum as I was going up and I knew it was the rapture. I was praising the Lord. I could feel the love of God going all through me. Now, the thing is, is that the Bible says in the twinkling of an eye, we will be caught up to be with the Lord. But it happened in the twinkling of an eye, but I didn't get there in the twinkling of an eye. Beloved, I estimate it took about two to three minutes to get from earth to heaven. I estimate it took about at least two minutes because I was so uh, anxious and so amazed. That, Lord, I can't believe it's still taking so long as I'm, as I'm going up, 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 up. It took about two to three minutes to finally let my feet to land in paradise. It was the most beautiful place in the world. People were coming from all over the world. They had landed in this place. On the um, in the suburbs, right in like this band show where there was mother of pearl and marble all over the floor. People were running to look to, for their relatives and, and screaming. And people were everyone was young. I saw my mother in the distance and we hugged each other and said, "It's really true, Mom. We've made it to heaven." It was an amazing experience, but it took two to three minutes to get there because we're our bodies, our spirits are like rockets. And many people tell us that who have rapture dreams that we're ascending. Jesus is standing in the clouds, hallelujah, he's coming halfway down to the earth, not touching the earth, his arms are extended, the trumpet sounds, and millions of people around the world are going to be going up, and many people will see us going up, and some who look back down, worrying about their brother, their sister, their mother, their children, they start going back down, but many people express that they see themselves going from earth to heaven, and there is a process of time. So this is important to fill your gasoline with oil, to fill your motorcycle with oil, fill your spirit man with oil. Amen. That we need to be filled with oil to make the journey. And what was it? It was a wedding. The most important thing, beloved, of this whole story is that it's your wedding. And we were not saved just to work for God or we were not saved just to be saved from hell. We were saved because Jesus said, you're his beloved and he married you. And now it's time for the marriage reception, the marriage supper of the lamb. When you said, I do, the Holy Spirit came in your heart. It was a deposit, hallelujah, of your salvation. Amen. But the full guarantee is when we make it to heaven, we're going to celebrate. And you don't want to miss your wedding because it's going to be more lavish than any wedding on the earth. Donald Trump's luxury and extravagance cannot top the kingdom of God, this wedding where food from all over the world will be there, where the fine, all the china is gold. It's going to be so lavish fountains. I mean, I have had visions just last week of the marriage supper, and the place is already set. The marriage table is already set. It's waiting for you and me. Jesus is waiting for us. Oh, everything is prepared. And so the Spirit of the Lord is speaking to the true remnant bride. I'm coming. I'm coming sooner than later. I'm coming in this now season. Get ready. Get your eyes on me because I'm getting ready to come. Okay, and so these wise virgins are hearing in their spirit that Jesus is coming. They're looking every day for him. So in this old ancient Hebrew wedding, what would happen? What would happen was that the bridegroom would call for the bride. The bridegroom comes, go out to meet him. That's the friend of the bridegroom would call for the bride. The bride would be sleeping in her wedding dress waiting for him every day. She had an idea about when he's coming and there will be food that's being prepared. So she had an idea when he was coming and she would, she would be taken in a palaguan, lifted up in a chair where there will be torches and there'll be oil lamps and all the virgins would take their oil lamps. They would light the wicks and they would go out in the middle of the night. That's why they needed oil. The lights would illuminate to see the journey in the middle of the night. They would all take their oil lamps and that lamp would illuminate their path that they could get from the bride's house to the groom's house. They'd be singing processional songs on the way. And most of the weddings were at night time. And this is depicting, this is right on with what Matthew 24 says. It's going to be nighttime. It's going to be dark in the world. Jesus says it's going to be midnight, the third watch of the night. He's coming at midnight. He's not coming at the last hour. He's coming at midnight before the fourth watch of the night. And so, therefore, we can know that uh, we're right there right now. And so, beloved, it's important to be ready. We don't want to be like the five that were left behind. In closing on this story, we have five now who were left behind. The door was shut. 
for all those people who say Jesus can't come yet because we haven't had a great revival because my brother, my sister, my mother, my cousin is not saved yet. The body of Christ is not ready. Yes, it's true. The body of Christ is not ready yet for the coming of the Lord. But the question is, does Jesus wait for the unprepared bride or does he come for those who are ready? Matthew 25 clearly reveals that he did not wait for the church who was not ready, but he came for those who were waiting, who were ready. And so let's just dispel that lie right now. Nothing else needs to happen. We don't, we won't see another revival before the coming of the Lord. Jesus told me when I was face to face with him in heaven, that the great outpouring is during the tribulation period, because that's the great harvest. That's the last harvest. That's the largest harvest. We are not suffered to wrath to be appointed to salvation. The Bible clearly tells us the heart of Jesus in Revelations and in the Bible that he says, pray that you'll be worthy to escape the things that are coming on the earth and to stand before the Son of Man. Pray that you'll be worthy to be taken for the wedding, that you'll be saved from that hour of Jacob's trouble. That's only for the Jews. That's not for you and me. And so there's only one wedding. There's only one rapture. It's at the very beginning. And then the tribulation happened and most of the body of Christ will be left behind. Because most of the body of Christ is not ready. And I had an all-night visitation when I was in heaven many years ago. All night I was in, taken to heaven. And it was just a glory experience. I'll put a link to that great encounter in this video. And Jesus spoke to me face to face and said only 20% of Christians will go in the rapture. 40% will be left behind. He showed me a big clock and it started five uh, minutes after the hour, 10, 15, 20, 35, 45, 40, and it stopped at 40. There was only 20 minutes left. So it was a ratio of 40, 20. As I looked at this big clock, I could no longer see the face of Jesus. And he said, you see that 40%, that's the majority of the body of Christ. All 40% are going to be left behind. Only the last 20% up to the hour, 20% will go in the rapture. Because, beloved, the whole church is not the bride. The bride is a select group in the church. Why? Because the way is narrow. It's not broad. Broad is the gate that leads to destruction, but narrow is the path that leads to salvation. His principles and his paths and his ways are always the same. They're unchanging. Jesus is coming for a remnant bride, not for a majority bride. We want to be that remnant bride who is taken, that 20% that is taken. And yes, 40% will be left behind. And what did it say to the 40% of Christians in the world today who were left behind, who call him Lord, but don't do what he say? He said, there's one. They said, Lord, open to us. And he said, I don't know who you are. And the second instruction was, go by oil. He says, the door was shut. He said, I do not know who you are. I do not have a personal relationship with you. You're not obedient to me. You're not doing what I want you to do. You know, and we have to be full of oil to do that. We have to be totally yielded to the Holy Spirit to be in that place where we're following him day to day. We have to have our ears to hear and our eyes to see and be following the master in true obedience to be that remnant that is taken. And so that's preparing that we need to do because the ones who were left behind had to go out and buy oil. Go get filled. Do what you were supposed to be doing before. Go get filled with oil. Cultivate your relationship with the Holy Spirit. Will the Holy Spirit be here when the bride is taken? Yes. Although the Holy Spirit restrains evil, the Antichrist cannot be revealed until he, speaking of the Holy Spirit, is taken out. The Holy Spirit will still be here, but he will not be restraining evil anymore. He'll be letting Satan have his way. He'll be letting Satan fill the earth with his demons, and it'll be the darkest time in history. And you don't want to be here for it as hell comes to earth. There'll be a great outpouring of the Spirit of God upon those who are calling upon him, of people who get saved during the tribulation period, as long as you don't take the mark of the beast. Because the Bible clearly reveals in Revelation chapter 14 that those who take the mark of the beast will be tormented day and night before the holy angels. In hell, because why? Because they took Satan's name. They said they were they, they gave their souls to Satan. And number two, because Jesus did not re come to redeem human robots, and that's what the mark does. It changes you half human, half robot, half AI robot. We were not created as robots with no soul. We were created as spirit beings made in the image of God. And so you're, he doesn't come for that kind of creature. He only comes 
for his creation who was made in his image. For no one can be saved if you have the mark of the beast. So I hope that explains everything. So we need to watch, we need to pray, and we need to be ready. And so my question is, beloved to you, are you ready? Are you prepared for the coming of the Lord? I pray that you are, but if you aren't, there's still time. And this is time for all of us to repent, to come back to our first love, to spend time with Jesus, recognizing that he is our bridegroom, he is our inheritance, he is our exceeding great reward, he is the one we're chasing after. Do not allow the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, the lust of other things coming in to choke the word of God in you. Do not allow the, the love of the world and even the love maybe of what your career is and what you're doing for God to overshadow your love for Jesus because he's a jealous God and he wants us to love us, love him with all his He wants us to love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. So, beloved, today, let's pray. I want you to be ready. I want to see you at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Every day I'm waiting for him to come. Every day I'm looking for him to come. And that is the heart of the remnant bride. She says, Mary not the Lord, come quickly. There's nothing on this earth that she desires more than being with her bridegroom. So it's wedding time. Father God, I just want to pray for my sisters and my Brothers who are watching this message today, I pray that this message encouraged them. I pray that it exhorted them. I pray that it was a good thermometer to gauge where they are in their relationship with you. Lord, I trust and I believe that the ones who are hearing this message today will be those wise virgins. But if there are any virgins here who have been unwise, there's still time. I ask Holy Spirit that you would draw them into your presence, that you would draw them to your feet like Mary. They would no longer be the Marthas, but be the Marys who sit at your feet and get filled with oil, that they would enjoy their time with you. Lord, that you would fill them to overflowing, that they have more to give out as they take in. And so, dear Lord Jesus, I thank you for my friends today. If there's anyone who doesn't know you, I pray that they would give their hearts to you today. I pray today if they recognize that they're not right, they're sinners, they've never been born again, they never, they don't know whether they would, where they would spend eternity. If there's anyone who needs to give their life to you, Holy Spirit, I ask you to quicken them today to give their life to you. In Jesus' name. You know, beloved, if you don't know Jesus, the Bible says, with the heart man believes, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Jesus died on the cross for you took away all your sins and it's, salvation is a free gift. It's not something that we can work for, but it's a free gift because Jesus paid the price for us on Calvary. By his stripes, we are healed and made whole. So if you put your faith in Jesus today, the Bible says the angels will rejoice. Your name will be written in heaven and the Holy Spirit will come and take his place in your life today. Would you pray this prayer with me if you don't know Jesus? Lord Jesus, I don't know you. But I want to. I'm a sinner. I have broken your laws and your commandments. I have hurt you, myself, and others. Just speak that out loud with me. But today, I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. Wash me clean in your precious blood, in the blood of Jesus. I open my heart to you today. And Holy Spirit, I invite you to come in. Take full possession of me. Fill me to overflowing with your presence that I can be a child of God. Give me that new nature. Let me be a new creation in Christ Jesus. Use me for your glory, Lord. Today, I renounce the world, I renounce Satan, and I renounce my own plans and ways, and I choose yours. Show me your path for my life. Let me be your obedient servant. And May my life glorify you all the days of my life. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. And I believe that I shall be one of those five virgins who are caught up to heaven in the twinkling of an eye when you come. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, beloved, if you prayed that prayer, I know that the Holy Spirit has come into your heart right now because he's faithful to his word. 
And I know that all the angels of heaven are rejoicing, and I'm going to see you at that marriage supper of the Lamb. Please write us at fgtv at poorhousministries.org if you prayed that prayer. We want to hear about those who said that prayer because we're going to tell you what to do next. Amen. You want to get into a good church and read your Bible daily so that you can be filled with oil and commune with the Holy Spirit. Well, beloved, thank you for joining me. Please like this video. Please share this video and tell somebody else what you learned today. But most importantly, prepare because he's coming sooner than later. God bless you. I'll see you next week.